Thank you for coming. It's uh, well, that'll do. The, um, uh, it's the end of the summer, so uh, I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. We uh, are going to try and aim for last time we managed to do it in an hour and three quarters. Not that that's the aim to just speed through it, but uh, just to keep things keep things focused. So I'll just go through the timings I've put against the agenda. Then I'll go back through the rough ground rules we agreed last time, and then we'll we'll get into the meeting proper. So uh, just a couple of minutes each for the proving the minutes and declarations of interest. We have no public questions, so that's 15 minutes saved. I think 20 minutes, if we can, for the social, children's social care and annual complaints report, but I appreciate that there's a lot of detail in there, so don't feel under pressure if it needs to go on. Same for planning for future school places. Uh, COVID recovery plan, 15 minutes, if we can. I'm guessing the budget might be the one that causes more questioning, so about 20 minutes, and then we've got the work plan of about 15 minutes, and then question time. No, no questions submitted, I believe, but um, it would be pointless not to allow you to ask questions as you come all the way out. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Going back over the ground rules that we agreed last time is the, the purpose of, of this policy and scrutiny committee is to make a positive impact on children's services, not to, fight, not to go for gotcha questions, because we're all here together to work uh, together for the same purpose. Promote good practice and seek it out. Challenge underperformance uh, when necessary but not as a witch hunt, uh, but more as a critical friend. Act as a catalyst for change. Deal with any partnership issues. Uh, have a focus on outcomes uh, rather than just uh, action. And most importantly, is enjoy the meeting, enjoy being part of this committee, I think. And thank you all for those of you that have traveled a bit further. So if we um, crack on into the meeting proper, if I sign the minutes, if that's uh, OK with everybody. They're all great. Everybody good? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great chairman. Good to sign those. Yeah, these ones do. Yeah, <laughs> those ones do. Yeah. That'll do. Full signature there. Um, oh, yes, Karen. I mean, it says I was here present, but I actually give my apologies. You did indeed. That's a shame because anything that didn't happen, we we're going to pin on you. <laughs> OK, any declarations of interest? Stephen. I'm a co-vice chair of governance at Holy Cross Catholic Primary School. And because we're talking about school places, I have two children in the school system. No public questions. So the children's social care and your complaints report, whoever's doing that. Are you are you there, Colin? Can you hear me, Mother? Sorry, I can. Sound kept cutting in out. Apologies. So, right, are you okay now? Yes. Ready to go. Smashing when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Colin Payne. I'm the head of information governance and business support uh, for children's services uh, in in Hampshire County Council, uh, and I have strategic responsibility for the uh, children's services complaints team, which also manages the uh, children's social care process as part of the partnership partnership for the island. The report submitted uh, for the committee is to update you on the production of the 2019-20 and the 2021 versions of the uh, statutory annual complaints report for children's social care complaints, which were included under the appendices of the report. Uh, it also provides a summary of local government and social care ombudsman, the LGSCO complaints uh, received into the departments during the 2021 reporting period. It provides an overview of the main complaints processes that are used, as well as identifying how the department has used sort of outcomes and feedback from complaints to identify opportunities for learning and has provided a comparison uh, of the number of LGSEO complaints received by the department during the reporting period and compared that to the council's statistical neighbours to provide some context of, of where we are at in terms of those numbers. As set out under section 2.1 of the report, there are two main processes used by the council to manage complaints 
regarding the children's services functions. Those are the children's social care complaints process and uh, the Isle of Wight Council's corporate complaints process. There are also complaints that are received from the local government and social care ombudsman where complainants are either escalating their complaint because they are still dissatisfied with the outcome uh, having exhausted the council's complaints processes or they've prematurely gone to the LGSEO before having exhausted our, our complaints processes and the LGSEO then require the council to put the complaint through our process. Any complaints put through the children's social care complaints process must follow a series of steps as set out in law. The statutory process has three stages to it. Stage one, seeking local resolution, before escalation to stage two, where an investigation with an independent person overseeing it takes place, before being escalated to stage three, where a review panel with an independent chair takes place. The statutory basis of the children's social care complaints process also requires the production of an annual complaints report with each reporting period covering the financial year, so from April to the end of March. As mentioned earlier, the 2019-20 and the 2021 versions have been included within the appendices of this report to demonstrate that firstly these have been reduced in line with the statutory requirement, but also to ensure that the committee have access to the information uh, and so that you're being kept informed of the process and updated on where we are at. In comparison, the corporate complaints process follows a two stage procedure. At stage one, the response is provided at the service level before then being escalated to stage two, where the head of service or strategic manager would provide a response. It's important that we see complaints as normal and regardless of the process being followed, it's important that the department identifies learning from them in order to recognise opportunities for improvement to service delivery. So we like to uh, ensure that we're taking on board what's coming out, the outcomes, the feedback to see how we can learn from them. In terms of the current position around the statutory social care process, so metrics I think would be uh, a benefit you uh, for you to understand the current position is that the department received a total of 64 representations in the 2021 reporting period. And a representation is the term that we use to describe the first instance of contact with the complaints team that requires an action. So all aspects of the complaints process under the, uh, the social care uh, procedure. This is a reduction of 6% from the 2019-20 reporting period, which also saw a decrease of one and a half working days on average to respond at stage one. So we've seen uh, uh, the services responding at a quicker rate in the uh, 2021 period compared to 1920. We also had five young people make a complaint, which is an increase from previous years where we only had two in 2019-20, and they now made up 16% of the statutory stage one complaints received, compared to only 7% in 2019-20, which is useful to, um, uh, to be aware of, to show that young people have that opportunity to put forward their concerns and raise any complaints should they feel the need. Alongside this, we also had five LGSEO complaints within the uh, the 2021 reporting period. So alongside considering the council's individual number of LGSEO complaints, it's also important to consider these in context against other councils. And table 1.1 in the report that sits after section 2.60 sets out the total number of complaints received by the LGSEO in regard to the council's children's services department but it also sets out the council's statistical neighbours and the total number of uh, complaints received for all council's children's services departments during the period of 1st of April 2020 to the 31st of March 2021. This table is helpful in terms of context setting as when compared to the council's statistical neighbours, the council received a significantly lower number of complaints than almost half of this group during the reporting period with only two of the council's statistical neighbours receiving less complaints overall. So 
So to summarise the report and the current position, we have in place established processes to manage complaints alongside a reporting system and approach to learning in order to identify opportunities for service improvement. We've seen a reduction in the number of children's social care complaints received in the 2021 reporting period compared to the 1920 period, as well as a reduction in the average number of working days to respond at stage one. And when compared to our statutory neighbours against the number of LGSCO complaints received, the council is in a positive position. I'm happy to take any questions uh, on the reports, whether the annual complaints report or the main uh, update report itself. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Have we got any questions for the children's services team? At all, anyone? Uh, if not, I've, I've got something that probably of a broader around the point of now having this back again, the, the complaints uh, report. is It's quite clearly back on track. Is there any particular reason you think we went off track for a while. Yeah, there's a couple of things in that. One, one was we had a, um, a slightly clunkier data collection system, so it took us longer to write the report. The second thing was we actually bumped it back on this agenda because just because of elections and so forth. So we it, it was a bit of a combination of those two things. Um, but this now puts us on a good we, we've actually this is the earliest we've ever got the the previous year's report ready because we've got the new data system so we're on a good track now and we can keep it up roughly this time of year can i start and can i just uh, firstly my apologies just thank you for your indulgence because i'm doing the the run from uh, southampton the second thing is uh, just this report came about when um we had had a case that went to the lgsco and want to acknowledge that really um think what we do we, we we work in difficult territory we we work in that territory and some of you all have heard me say this before between everybody believes that their their family has a right to a private life and everybody believes that their children should be protected and we sort of work in that gray area sometimes and we don't always get it right we get it right many many more times than we get it wrong and when we do get it wrong we need to listen and, and understand but we also we shouldn't just sort of roll over and if somebody complains because that that might not be right either they might not have got the right end of the stick so it's a really complex process that we have to go through to understand what it is that is lies behind the issue and whether sometimes we can't make things right for everybody but what is is there anything we can learn about it and, and i think the the format in which we do these reports now about you know it, the, the issues that it raises for the consideration is really quite helpful for us as a uh, for us as officers in terms of understanding these are some important things to think about as, as we go go forward so uh, i would have said that as an introduction if i got here on time but that hopefully will round it out a little bit to be fair you're only you didn't miss much in all fairness <laughs> <laughs> you did you did well considering red funnel service yes sir. probably an obvious one could has the covid had any impact on these figures at all is it, is it relevant in this time scale um can i can i come back on that it's, it's about content the um i don't it didn't have a direct impact i don't think um sometimes services were a bit more difficult to access or we found it more difficult to do certain things we might have to do things online rather than in person which didn't always make people happy but the substance of, of it not really um there were one or two, but there were bits around the edges in terms of the margins about what, you know, you know sometimes people aren't happy because we didn't do things quickly enough. And that COVID probably, you know, had a, had a minor no, impact on that. Yeah. Sorry, uh, just with families being caught in close proximity when they would have probably been out most of the day or something. And I just wondered if there was any difference in the. Sure. The, the, the other tangential impact, and, and Cathy might want to say a bit more about this, but the other tangential impact is that because of covid and i think there is a direct link here it's certainly in terms of children's social care we've had to go and do more assessments and be involved in more families and because we were involved in more families you're more likely to cause you know if you if you upset one in a hundred we're dealing with more than that you know, we're dealing with more people so you just get more um unhappiness sometimes because of that 
um, because because the activity has really really increased um, as a result of COVID. Is there anything I add to that? Go. Um, I think our presentation later will illustrate some of the increase in demand that we've had through the front door. Although, I mean, just a reflection from what's filtered through to me is that we haven't seen a significant increase um, in concerns related to the impact of COVID. Um, some of the concerns are, are kind of familiar themes, really, in terms of communication, in terms of a disagreement around an assessment. Um, so they're, they're familiar themes that we've seen in previous reports. Um, and we've really got to a as uh, Steve has said, listen to that and make sure that we're understanding. But also sometimes we don't agree with the complainant um, and we have to provide evidence as to why we think we've got a contrary view. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, to be fair, Red Funnel is still blaming COVID for you being late, so you could have got, you could have got away with that. You could have thrown, thrown a spadeful of that on. Um, in terms of complaints, I think there's a danger if we don't see complaints that it becomes a bit like the West Midlands Crime Squad, is that, you know, that it's, it's behaving very well. So I'd be more worried if we didn't see complaints, because at the end of that, that's what this committee's for. So I think, you know, if somebody suggested a target of reducing complaints, I would fight very hard against that, because it doesn't make any sense. Is there any scope within this complaints procedure? Because some things must be able to be dealt with quite rigorously and robustly without going through the full procedure. Is that possible? Am I wasting your time asking that? Yes, but it's a bit of a bone of contention. And uh, Colin might want to come in on this one because um, we have to follow the rules that are set down by the Local Government Social Care Ombudsman. And um, uh, they've occasionally come up with, with a view on things about the process we should follow, which sometimes we've been surprised about. And in particular, We've had a, in fact, one that, if, if I've got it correct, the complaint that went to LGSCO also, it did, it did incorporate um, some issues around, we tried to deal with it early on, but they wanted to progress it through to the next stage. And that became a bone of contention in and of itself. Colin, do, do you want to add to what I've said there? Yeah, no, yeah. you're Absolutely right, Steve. The the uh, statutory process places the ability to progress it forward completely in the control of the complainant. So a complainant could make their complaint at stage one. They could have a, a complete response, every uh, part uh, responded to. It could be every part upheld. But for some reason, if they were still dissatisfied, they have the right to automatically escalate to stage two and then in the same way automatically escalate up to stage three. There's a couple of bits that, that obviously allow us uh, to be able to, to stop that, but in the main, it is completely at the discretion of the complainant. Which I suppose really, if you are a complainant, that's what you want, isn't it? To be, to be fair, if you're in that position. So I suppose on that basis then, is there anything that we can help with that you might want to change or to improve the complaints procedure? Is there anything that you'd want to change in a positive way for everybody, for all parties, as it were? Um, I, I think our procedure is, is as it should be. What, what I think will be useful, and we've started to do that in these reports, is to build an, a sort of iterative um, process to, to layer on what did we learn from last year's complaints? How have we responded to those? And what have we seen differently about this year's complaints? Now, we've not always had the, a good enough database to do that, but we've got it now. And I think this is, this is what we're trying to build in these reports. So the best thing that I can advise is that when we come back next year, we have a look at what this year said and then look at next year. And have we got a difference? Some things won't change because they're not changing. The, the SEN tribunal process is not changeable, for example. So we just, you know, that will happen. But are there things that we have changed as a result and we can begin to build that up um, and you over the next four years you hopefully get that picture of how things progress thanks that makes sense and is there anything i suppose from those complaints then that um, as headlines you'd say you do different um, as a consequence The, the obvious one is the uh, is the LGSCO one, where we we ultimately the LGSCO took a different view from us, and the the question we've got to ask ourselves is, well, you know, we we took a view on that, and we we sort of fought our position, shall we say, 
but ultimately we lost. So we need to think about whether we should have just fought that, uh, that and conceded that position at an earlier stage. And we'll probably do that again if we had our time again. Thanks, Steve. That's uh, very candid and nice of you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Uh, now, is it further presentation on the annual complaints report? We're we moving on to future school places now. Which is it? Whoever's next. Marvellous. Yeah, Martin's there. Okay. Hello. I can, I can just about hear you. So, can you hear me? That's because I didn't have my microphone on, Mike. And sorry, that's my entirely my fault. Um, and I understand you've got uh, some slides that you can present to us on this one, yeah? Yeah, I've got the slides. Would you like me to present them? I know. I think they've been presented to you in your packs too, but I'll certainly pull them up and uh, present. Um, Check. Can I, can I ask if you, you want to speak? We have got them in the pack, whichever's easiest for you, Martin, really. Um, well, I'll, I'll present if that's OK, then, because then I'll know what I'm talking to. But do feel able to good idea to, to jump around. I can probably cope with that. Page, so, page 93 for everybody. Just making sure I'm putting up the right version and sharing now. Let me know as and when it comes through. You're on. That's coming through now, Martin. But can you put it on on full presentation? Because otherwise, it's very small for us. Yeah. Okay. I will do. It just gets slightly harder for me to navigate, but that's absolutely fine. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Martin Goff, head of homeschool transport, school admissions. Do a bit of school place planning and and a few other jobs within uh, within Isle of Wight's uh, children's services department. Um, Perhaps transport is the, the big one of the moment, but today I'm mostly talking about uh, the school place planning for you as a scrutiny committee. Um, the brief I've been given is to talk you through the admissions processes um, and the things that we do to just have um, an admissions framework in place so that mums and dads can make applications for school places for their children. So I'm starting with some stuff around admissions processes and then taking it forward into the numbers that we that we handle and also the the available school places the first thing that's mentioned on the first slide is just the policy as it exists across the community and voluntary controlled schools on the isle of wight um, there are a number of schools that there are, are their own admissions authority school and so they can have slightly uh, uh, variations on our theme here but we are trying to give priority to children who already have a sibling on role of the school they're applying to who will also be there when the child starts in school. And then secondly, it's for a, the child whom it is the nearest school to their home. At any moment in time, uh, and you know, we've just started school now, uh, there are three admissions years going on at once. The first thing we're talking about is a child who wants to start immediately in school, what we call in-year admissions. So they'll come into the school during 2021, 2022. In just a few weeks time we'll be opening the main admissions round for children who are currently in year six and need to move into year seven in September uh, 2022 um, and they'll be making applications to the Isle of Wight's secondary schools and then we also need to go through a consultation process to put in place our next round of admission arrangements so if there were a discussion about for instance a significant change in the admissions policy we would need to go out to consultation in the autumn term and also any changes to admission numbers, um, reductions to admission numbers would need to be part of that consultation. Um, you can see in the next table the sorts of numbers that we're dealing with uh, each year. So, so the numbers of admissions that, that we've been handling um, and you can see that in year admissions are going up and that's quite a problem for our schools that 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 turbulence that goes with children moving between schools, especially that but also children arriving on island. And it might be that when they arrive that the, the nearest school doesn't have available spaces. Um, we have a process to follow uh, when we can't meet um, a parent's application of, uh, to a preferred school. We always offer a next nearest school with a space, so no child is left without a school. And in some circumstances, transport eligibility, eligibility applies, and that means the local authority um, providing that transport assistance. 
There is a statutory appeals process that sits behind every application that is refused. Um, moving on and just giving you a, a flavour of the, um, the going forward um, timetable, you can see it's quite a busy world and all of this is heavily legislated. It's prescribed in a school admissions code and some, some primary legislation that we must follow all these processes. It's taking you forward, but it, what it's also not mentioning is something I, I've just mentioned, which is at the same time as we're going through the discussions to try and put in place the admissions arrangements for 2023, um, the admissions rounds will open for 2022. And so 31st of October 2021 and 2022 is a closing date for secondary school applications. The same applies for January 2022 and 2023 for primary school applications and then the offer days are replicated as well. So this is this is the process really just for putting everything in place in 2023. But don't forget there's other things going on for 2022 and we're also handling in year admissions. Um, taking in admissions into school places now and just thinking a little bit more about what we do in there. The first thing is to say is. If we're going to change any admission numbers, and I'll talk about do we need to change any admission numbers in a minute, if we're going to change any admission numbers, we need to follow that st that statutory timetable for consulting on all reductions to published admission numbers. So that goes on during the autumn. It starts as a conversation with the school and then can plays out through the uh, statutory public consultation. Recent changes to admission numbers are highlighted in the tables for you. Um, and then we also mentioned the closure of All Saints because obviously that's had an impact on school place planning in, in that planning area. The table I perhaps draw your attention to in particular is um, the secondary school table where you can see reductions from ca at cows from 270 to 210. Christ the King in two steps is going from 270 to 180 and Medina 260 to 180. Those, those changes are coming about where the schools are looking at the children they're admitting, the number of parental preferences they're receiving, and are really trying to match the number of offered places to, to their intakes based on that combination of parental preference and offers. Um, and it's, it's quite an understandable approach for the, for the secondary school to want to take because when you admit, admit 180 children against your published admission number of 270, you only put in place provision for that 180 children, which is roughly six classes worth of, uh, of curriculum uh, provision. So there aren't 90 spare spaces in the school in that year group because the published admission number says 270 and they've only got 180 children on roll. Their provision is still full. So th th there's a real sense to that, that, that we do understand in the local authority. Um, Taking us forward and just looking at what's going on in this, I'll just call it the demography that is, is so important in, in, in admissions to schools. What you can see is that if we go back to 2012, 2013, 2014, what we had was higher numbers coming through into the system. As we've moved forward from about 2019 onwards, you can see that we only predict a reduction in the number of four year olds living in the area. Now, the colour coding is just to show you how we've been measuring over time this information set from the National Health Service and how it's been showing um, a declining numbers that has often played out quite close to the forecast. So, for instance, in March 2018, you can see the yellow line showed you this is what we expected. And now the green line takes us all the way through. And it, it, in fact, it sorry, it increases the reduction. Um, this is. Uh, I'll just go back a second. So these are numbers I shared with the schools back in the summer of 2017, and it's this 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 forecast drop uh, of, of around about 200 children fewer coming into the primary schools that is really underpinning the school place planning strategy for the local authority. You know, if there's only between 1,100 and 1,200 children coming into the school rather than into all our schools rather than over 1300, it makes a big difference to the size of the primary co uh, phase provision that we need to have. And eventually that rolls forward to become a secondary school issue. Um, uh, moving on, and just so that you understand how we do our, our, our primary, our school place planning, 
and this is a picture of the primary planning areas, we, we have to have these in place to be able to make returns to the local authority. And most local authorities over the last 10 years or so have been providing the Department for Education with what's called the SCAP return that, that was telling them a picture of growth in demand for primary school places. That hasn't happened on the island and we've always had excess capacity, surplus capacity in our primary schools. Having the planning areas doesn't mean all the children of the West White go to schools in the West White. It's just a, a convenient way to, to map over time the progress of the, uh, the numbers in schools. And it does, it does allow us to have a mechanism and a methodology for, for, for forecasting school places. For our secondary schools, we do just treat the island as a single um, entity usually, but we also do have to have something that just looks at the individual schools in Cowes, the school, the, the group of three schools in Newport, and then um, uh, the, the island free school with the bay and, and, and ride on its own. And, and again, there's reasons for that that just relate to this, the, um, the return to the Department for Education. Um, there's a bit of detail there about how we do our forecasting methodology. I wasn't planning to go through that. that. That's there to read. And if there's any questions you want, what I would say is individual schools will sometimes raise with me that there's something wrong. And, and if I'm honest, my forecast <laughs> is incorrect. But what you find is as you bring schools together and aggregate them, the forecast for the area tends to be very accurate. And what we can't easily forecast for is quite rapid fluctuations in parental preference. So one school becoming more popular than another in an area. Um, but when you look at the numbers across the area, we do tend to be really quite accurate. Um, so what do we think is going to happen? Some numbers I presented to you earlier in the presentation showed you the number of four year olds, which is the number from the National Health Service. I've said there in a sentence, typically 90 children in the four year old population figure do not join year R in Isle of Wight Council maintained schools. That's that's a that's a, that's an average figure. It has been reducing recently, suggesting to me that the NHS figure is closer to the real number of children living on the island at the time that we're processing their applications. But what I would highlight from this is this reduction from 1300 children joining year R because these numbers up to 2020, 2020 have all happened and we're just about to assess the 2021 figure, but we're showing a reduction to something like just over a thousand in 2023 and even lower in 2024, 25 and beyond. Although I would expect those numbers to increase slightly because they're based on a part year data set for zero year olds. In the data that I've shared for year seven there, you don't begin to see the drop, but seven years after, 2022, when only 1,125 children join year R, that lower figure will be rolling forward into year seven. And so it's inevitable that the secondary schools will feel the effect of the lower numbers in the primary phase. Um, and this just gives you an idea of the total numbers in the schools. So our primary phase schools have been of the order of 9,100 children and slightly higher for a couple of years, but they will reduce and become closer to 8,000 children. And similarly so in um, the secondary phase, I'm showing you figures in the 6,200s, but over time that is going to reduce and, and, and move towards 5,000. And that's, a, that's got a big revenue budget implication. It's got a big um, curriculum planning implication in individual schools. And, um, and, and it's almost another presentation, the impacts of these numbers that I'm presenting. But that was what I was uh, asked to present. Any questions? Thank you, Martin. Have we any questions for Martin? Rodney. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, could you, I'll not be a bit ignorant on this, but could you please tell me about um, preferences for uh, which schools people are going to, how many children that, um, how many choices are there for parents to see which school they want to go to? Okay, the, the process Sorry. they use is to um, express three preferences during what we call the main admissions round. So um, 
the, the legislation, Rodney, actually allows up to six. And in some authorities, particularly big urban authorities, London, Birmingham, et cetera, they do use all six. But that tends to relate to that circumstance where six are almost within walking distance. Most 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 places like the island where there's some sort of some urban centres, but also rural places, three tends to be sufficient. If we increase to four preferences, for example, I don't think we would do a great job of meeting parental preference until the admissions round that we've just administered in March 2021. Steve would desperately want me to say this. We have been phenomenally good at meeting parental preference on the Isle of Wight, top of <laughs> any league table that you really wanted to put together. But the secondary admissions round for September 20, uh, 2021 did just pull that trend. And, we, you know, we found um, and I think you'd have followed it in the newspapers, for instance, cows wasn't offering to all its first preferences. And as a result, that that really high level of parental preference wasn't met for the first time this year. Thank you. Is that answer your question, Rodney? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, any other questions for Martin or the wider children's service team? Tig. Hi, um, Martin, thanks for uh, introducing that report. I've got a question relating to the uh, projected numbers uh, published on the Isle of Wight Council website, in fact, um, with regard to admissions for school year 22-23. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed there's uh, four primary schools uh, St. Helens, Yarmouth, Bryston and Chillerton with num admission numbers 15 or below uh, for that year. Um, I wonder whether you're looking for uh, at, at the projections, whether uh, the viability of some of the schools with the lower intakes could be um, somewhat questionable. Um. There's a first response that is we do have a number of small, deliberately small schools across our across our offer on the Isle of Wight, and so the by necessity a number of schools get quite adept at taking in a small intake and making a success of the educational offer for uh, for, for the number that join them. And, and being a school based on an intake of 15 uh, creates a, a full school of 105 if you recruit fully every year. So schools of fewer than 100 children can be very successful. If you look at it from a viability and financial perspective, you, 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 you'll find that there are small schools of that size who are doing a great job of managing their, their budgets. And, um, and, and so the viability from a financial point of view and the viability from the point of view of what's the uh, experience of the children is really quite strong in many small schools. But what you also have to be doing is looking at it quite regularly. And if you take the example that you did mention of Chillerton and Rookley, th that school has had uh, in the build up to 2021 for most of the build up just zero and then one application. And, and, and really just one child joining a, a reception intake, I'm sure Brian would agree, just doesn't feel like a good offer for that child because they can only be taught alongside other ages of children. So it, it's, a, it's a constant watching brief. Um, and But but the, the forecast of fewer than 15 alone wouldn't be a reason to question viability. We would be looking across a number of factors. The, the other thing about, that might help members to just understand it a bit more is uh, the the way that funding is apportioned follow pretty much follows the child. So the, the, there's the thing called ORPU, which stands for I can't remember what the A stands for. Brian, help me with the A. Age related age, age related people weighted, weighted people unit ORPU, but that's essentially that that's the that's the the figure on the child's head. So it's about four thousand for a, a secondary school child, and I think it's three thousand two hundred per primary. And of course, you, you need enough yeah, um, to to pay a teacher and all those sorts of things. And that that's that that's at the root of it. Um, it the, so fund you know that's the, the calculation that has to go into this. So the funding follows the the children. 
Thank you, Steve. Any further questions? Rob. It's certainly true that the um, national, uh, well, let me put it this way, uh, prior to 2015, uh, local areas, local authorities could, had a lot more flexibility in the way that they um, chose to allocate funding to schools. So around that time, and I think it was 2015, um, a national funding formula was introduced and it was made quite clear that that uh, Initially, that was, quote, a soft funding formula, but it was going to become a hard funding formula. And, and what we had to do was, over the next few years, align ourselves with that funding formula, um, which we've done. Uh, but part of that, uh, and it has been raised, it's been raised in Parliament and it's been um, uh, you know, raised with DfE officials, is that it does seem to disadvantage small schools. Um, because they've lost some of the lump sums that they would get, and so it becomes all pupil related, and that does seem to have had a negative impact. The DfE started talking, and you might, if you delve down into the, um, the the weeds of this, you might hear stuff around sparsity and things like that, and rurality. But actually, very few schools qualify for that type of funding, um, and certainly not, I don't think many, if any, on the island do. It's about proximity to other schools and so forth. So. Um, yeah, the answer is that over the last few years, that is probably true through, not through our volition, but through the introduction of a national funding formula, which we, we've had to align ourselves with. So, in that sense, is it is it fair to say that small schools might become less viable because, um, because of that situation? I was just interested in, in opinions on that. Um, yes, I think that that's probably fair comment. Um, when we look at the evidence, and I'm, uh, I'm going to be slightly out of order and, and use evidence from Hampshire in this, in that the definition of small is quite an interesting one. So it also, um, the schools that we are seeing struggling are actually small secondaries at the moment in, in our terms. So um, less than 650 is a real struggle for a secondary school. Um, and that's not a scenario that we have on the island, so that's good. Um, it's more, more particular, shall we say, when it comes to small um, primary schools. Um, and there are a number of different factors that go into that. But it, it's the, 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 the sort of mood music all points in that direction, doesn't it? Thank you. I guess if you, you've got a year in tape and you need, say, £40,000 to pay a teacher and you've only got 10 kids, which is 32000 unless you've got an excess somewhere else, you, you are on a... Yeah. Um, any other questions? I, I've got a couple, as is my want. Sorry, Martin. Um, four-year-olds, the stats on four-year-olds, is that the same across the rest of the UK or are we slightly special on the island? Um, <laughs> Whatever I go on to say, I'll of course start with uh, the island is special. The, I think the thing that I would say is most different from having been the, the geek that maps this stuff, you know, relentlessly where, wherever I can is, and, and I do that across the island in, in the school place planning areas of the island, has been you didn't experience the growth that we did in, in different ways in the other places I've been watching. And, and, and if I take Hampshire as the example, because I, I know it's sort of easier for us to do, but Winchester, Gosport began its growth and had experienced it all by about 2012-13 and is now in a period of declining numbers. 
Winchester was a little bit slower than that. Hart was slower still, but had lots of house building. And so you can you can see really specific impacts on their, 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 their figures. The island just doesn't seem to have that. When we have new houses, I have all sorts of ways to talk excitedly about the effect it has and the impact it has on school place planning, but not on the Isle of Wight. We build additional houses and it doesn't seem to bring additional families with children of school age into the area in such a way that I can manage it, uh, so not manage it, pick out the detail and start to talk to you as though it, uh, it becomes a factor in my school place planning. It seems to more move children around the island um, and it doesn't make, it's difficult to summarise when those are the figures you're looking at. You know, um, uh, Professor Whitty would probably have a different way of describing this, but all of the new house building we've been watching hasn't delivered the additional 30 children per 100 houses that I would have talked to on, on, on a normal mixed type and tenure housing development of any uh, of more than 100 houses in Hampshire. So there is very definitely something going on around um, the numbers of four year olds. It has stayed static largely and it has begun to decline. Now, I'm not a great expert on this one. There's others in the room much more qualified to talk about this, but when there are babies, there are usually uh, women around and um, women of a certain age. And so if you do some measuring of that population, um, then you can start to see the patterns in the number of children being born. And I, I haven't done it very recently, but I've looked at it in the past and, and that's where some of the issues arise. Um, if there were more 20 to 40 year old women, you probably begin to be able to say something about the, the future number of four year olds, but that's not in our favour either. And that's another reason for me standing by the forecasts of a couple of years ago that, that were the first time of predicting this decline in numbers into the primary schools. OK, thank you for that. I mean, that, I suppose that does feed into the problem we've got with housing on the island. I'm guessing that all we're doing is building housing for people that are currently in crisis on the island, but that, that is a guess. So, uh, so we've got to go and attract 20 to 40 year old women to the island. OK, so we'll put some on track, I'm sure. Um, if possibly an unfair question, um, if you had a magic wand, Martin, because it does sound like a problem coming down the track for schools, hopefully not education, but for schools. If you had a magic wand, how would you solve the intake issue? That the intake, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, wine and flowers, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> And Brian, you surely you meant to mention curry as well then. Um, the, the, the conversation has begun quite actively with schools and I think there's probably some frustration in our for our colleagues in schools because what that conversation doesn't quickly yield is obvious actions, but it does start to explore our options because they are quite limited. If you take a, a system with um, around about 400 um, places on offer and I'm predicting fewer than 300 children to arrive in that area, you've got to do something and you've got to make some very deliberate and well considered judgments around do we reduce the number of places on offer and keep the same number of schools, which creates a circumstance in which smaller schools are operating in larger buildings, if that makes sense. You, you know, you, you plan for a school to be as big as 210 children, but it's actually got physical accommodation for more like, let's say, 330 children. Or do you do a full school reorganisation discussion and consider closure? Now, in their way, neither are easy um, because what also doesn't happen is the reduction in numbers and demand for places doesn't necessarily fall into nice easy packets to work with. So a published admission number of 45 could drop to 30 and over time a structure in the school would 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 adapt and become based on seven classes rather than 11 classes. But if you actually recruit 36 children you're restricted in how you can structure your school. So the magic wand would be that we have to consult on this 
Um, where schools are starting to see fewer parental preferences, they themselves will want to adapt their published admission numbers and the structures that sit behind them for the reasons that Steve explained around ORPUs and what class structure they can afford. Um, and I think the, the thing that is probably most difficult is, is are we going to grasp the nettle of a school reorganisation and potential school closure? Or do we just let the, the conversations play out through schools, recruiting slightly fewer children and seeing for themselves a strategic direction for their financial planning sort of in isolation, albeit within a school place planning area? Did that make sense as an answer? It did to me, Ryan. Is everyone else OK with saying that? Yeah. OK, thank you for that, Mark. I mean, it's not the best news you could deliver, I know, but it's, uh, you are just the messenger. Thank you for that. Any further questions? No? It just, uh, it might, uh, and Councillor Andrews just sort of mentioned it to me, but it might be helpful, Martin, if you just clarified differences between admissions between local authority maintained schools and academies, because that also plays into that debate about school planning, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So, um, as, as the local authority, um, we have the duty to provide sufficient school places and when a, when a child moves into area we, we um, or you know fa families are coming through the system with their four year olds, we must ensure everybody has a school place. Um, setting the, adm the admission arrangements and the admission numbers for a number of the island schools is done either by their governing body or their academy trust. So I'll use Cowes Enterprises College as an example. You know, the, almost an academy trust sets the admission arrangements for Cows Enterprise College, they must follow the same statutory um, process as us and do. I have to say that they do. Um, if they want to use their admission number, they do need to consult with the local authority. And we need to take that view as the provider of sufficient school places. And if they arbitrarily try to reduce to 150, we would say to them, I'm sorry, we, we can't support that. And we could object to them taking that, that decision. Um, so the conversation that I mentioned in one of my slides around Medina and Christ the King, both of those schools are own admission authority schools. Both of them have proposed their reduction in admission number. And what we've said is, well, we won't object to it, but we need a, we need a, a conversation with all the schools together to make sure that we can meet that duty to supply sufficient school places because as they reduce their admission numbers, we get closer to the number of children in, that, that live on the island and will want those places. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it is, like I say, it is a problem coming down the track, isn't it? We saw the, the problem this year, and I do appreciate the amount of work you guys have to do, and I'm sorry for ladies, uh, have to do to make it happen. I suppose the difficult bit is that if you are a parent, you want your first choice, don't you? Um, as as we've discussed before, Martin. But um, thank thank you again. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you very much. So, COVID and education recovery plan. Is that better? That's better, isn't it? So the, these are correct as of today. Um, government guidance changes fairly regularly around COVID. And what I've tried to do is assimilate something like 200, 250 pages of different DfE guidance into these slides. Um, what we've done today and over the next few days is we've created a number of webinars, which all schools have been invited to. So we've done uh, a webinar for early year settings one for primary schools, one for secondary schools, one for post-16 providers, and one for specialist provisions, where we've run through a slide pack and we've given head teachers the opportunity to ask questions. And um, we've had colleagues from public health and the school improvement team um, field in answers to those questions, just to give people clarity as to what the latest um, guidance says. So, um, trying to get this down into 10 slides. So firstly, the, the, the first bit is there remains a continued focus on infection prevention and control. That still remains the first barrier against COVID. So ensuring there is good hygiene. Sorry, it's got the flow by. I'm not sure everybody's on the slides. 
Um, oh, we handed around paper copies. Oh, sorry, Steve. Right, okay. Okay. Has somebody got a copy for Sue? Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry about that. And, and we were looking at how we presented it on the big screens, but it's impossible with Hampshire device. So, yeah. so ensuring good hygiene, hand washing, making sure when you cough, you cough into your elbow and all those kind of things. So, yeah. Um, head teachers and other members of staff really pushing those messages strongly with parents and the students so everybody understands what's expected of them. Um, ensuring there are appropriate cleaning regimes in place and there's proper advice and guidance as to how services, um, surfaces and exact, um, floors and things should be cleaned. Um, there's something around making sure spaces are well ventilated and by that we mean making sure windows and doors are kept open from time to time. Um, making sure that any public health advice that's given is followed and public health have been brilliant, I have to say, on the island in when head teachers have got queries in answering those queries as well. Um, face coverings are now discretionary in schools, apart from on public um, and design school designated transport as well. So th those are some of those bits. Um, we then got um, a slide on lateral flow device testing. So you'll be aware probably from the media that all secondary school age pupils and all college students have been asked to have two tests on site before they go back to school. And many people have said, well, why are they asking them to do them on site, given they've been doing them at home for months and months and months? And the public health advice on that is if they are supervised, you get better accuracy with them. So that's really at the behest of public health that have said do them on site. And they have to be three to five days apart. Um, once they've done those tests on site, they then get a stock of lateral flow devices to take home as well. Um, we've also got another programme operating on the island. We've only got one school signed up to that at the moment, which is Medina House Special School. Um, they are also undertaking saliva testing, uh, which again is an alternative to lateral flow device testing. Some schools are doing it in tandem with lateral flow testing, but basically the children take home a pot um, they spit in the pot and bring it back to the school. The school, a van comes around and collects up all those pots of spit and takes them off to the lab to be tested. Um, and they're all labelled with the individual child who's provided the, the, split, the spit. Um, we, we, we affectionately call that gob and go in the trade. <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's then something around risk assessments. All schools are expected to have a risk assessment, which is a live document. And the purpose of the risk assessments is obviously mis mitigating the risk of transmission to keep transmission rates as low as possible. Um, and that also relates to other diseases other than COVID. People have been in lockdown for a long period of time and therefore other viruses such as flu, we're expecting a kind of rise in some of those as, as social contact becomes more prevalent. So, again, schools are doing huge, great communication with staff, with visitors, with the children, with the parents to reinforce those measures. Um, schools are looking really carefully at ventilation. Um, the first um, CO2 um, monitors are being sent out to special schools this week um, because apparently if there's a high proportion of CO2 in the air, it is an indicator of poor ventilation. Uh, and obviously, you'll know what the advice is. What happens if you find out there is poor ventilation, you open a window. This is the main um, mitigation strategy. Uh, and then we're also being really careful in those risk assessments of any staff or students that are clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, and actually, we're advising if they are a close, close contact, they should go and get a PCR and they should self-isolate until they know the outcome of that PCR. Whereas for the rest of the population, um, you don't have to wait until you've got the results um, and you can come out self, you're, out of, you're only in self isolated if you test positive. Um, there's a requirement to undertake risk assessments for pregnant women. That has always been the case, but we're particularly making sure that is happening with schools. Um, there's also ad actions and procedures that we're asking schools to contingency plan for just in case schools start getting a, a large number of cases or there is a large number of cases in particular communities as well. We're also really minded of safeguarding in amongst all this. So if teachers test positive, we do have to make sure that we can still cover 
the safeguarding advice of keeping children safe in education in full. And we have had occasions where the designated safeguarding lead, who is the person with the training, catches COVID, and we have to arrange emergency cover from another school to cover the safeguarding aspects. But we're really careful around the safeguarding agenda. And then also we're asking schools to be really mindful of the well-being, stress and anxiety agenda around COVID-19. Schools are doing an awful lot of work around that with their students and staff. Um, here are some key changes from the DfE guidance. Um, so bubbles and social distancing, schools, colleges and other out-of-school settings are no longer expected to keep pupils in bubbles and they don't have to put um, arrangements in place to reduce mixing between groups. Um, from the 16th of August, um, fully vaccinated ad adults and children at school uh, are, are not a, are required to self-isolate unless they've got symptoms or they've tested positive with a PCR. Um, I've already said a bit about um, face coverings. We can now sing together. We can play wind and brass instruments together as, as well. Um, although I have to say some schools have been doing that under a tight risk assessment um, previously. Schools are no longer doing contact tracing. That's now passed over to NHS Track and Trace. And only the people that are contacted by NHS Track and Trace are the people that have to go and get a PCR test. Schools are no longer stepping into that space. It's being left to the Track and Trace team. Um, year six students transition into year seven, um, same as the rest of the popu secondary population have been offered the two tests at the start of the autumn term as well. Um, just, a mo just a question on thresholds. There's some thresholds in the guidance and, and basically if one of these thresholds have met, we are asking schools to make sure they ring the local public health team and take proper advice. And the thresholds really are five students in a school or 10% of students, students or staff. Um, and if they meet that threshold, that isn't a threshold for closing the school or anything as drastic as that. It's a question of having a conversation with public health to see if we should ramp up the contingency measures. Should we bring back face masks for a period of time? It's a ramp up the risk assessment. Um, special schools have slightly different guidance because they're smaller and schools with less than 20 students are, are, are slightly smaller. So in those instances, it's two students um, is enough to trigger a conversation with public health. Um, this is an interesting one as well. Um, you can see situations where both parents are asked to self-isolate, but because their child is under the age of 18, they don't have to self-isolate. So we've got a series of um, arrangements in place whereby either the family ask a friend or another family member to take them to school. If the school has to step in arrange transport, we can provide financial support through the practical support grants which public health administer. Um, schools can try and arrange transport through friends of the family and again they will have their mileage paid through that but if all those options fail the parents can contact our school transport team and we will put transport in place and again that will be paid for from the public health grants as well um, vaccination um, all 16 and 17 year olds on the island now have been offered one covid vaccine. I found out this morning from health colleagues about a series of meetings with health colleagues about vaccination. Um, they are expecting by tomorrow across the Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Portsmouth, Southampton region to have got about 68% of um, 16 and 17 year olds vaccinated, which I think given where we started a few weeks ago is pretty impressive actually. Um, we're still continuing to encourage staff to have their COVID vaccination, but our intelligence is that most staff did go and get vaccinated in schools. Um, and obviously, to make the point, vaccination doesn't stop the transmission of the disease. It, it does reduce it, but it doesn't eliminate it. Um, I am in a series of conversations at the moment about the national discussion about vaccinations for 12 to 15 year olds uh, and I know there are lots of different views out there around that but my suspicion is that will be brought in. It looks to me as though the vaccination programme will be run through schools uh, and I'm trying to encourage a dialogue between secondary schools and health so that we can work in partnership if that national guidance changes and 12 to 15 year olds um, do need to be vaccinated or are required to be vaccinated. Um, so we're working on that at the moment. Um, 
Support for schools. Um, I can't speak highly enough of your public health team over here. I have to say, head teachers, when they get a case and they want advice, it's not time specific and it doesn't happen during office hours. So, you know, I will get an email at nine o'clock at night. I've suddenly been told by a parent, we've got three cases. Brian, what should we do? There has not been an occasion ever where I have not rung a public health official at nine o'clock at night and have not got an answer. Nobody's working office hours around providing advice to school. We are being really stringent to getting the advice out at the right time. And your public health colleagues have worked their socks off to try and make sure that happens. For early years settings, we've got an early years specialist um, team that give advice for that. We've got the school improvement team for primary and secondary age children. We've got a post-16 team that's giving advice there. Um, again, your media team at, at the Isle White Council media team has been really strong when um, they've had media inquiries, they've worked with the schools um, to try and ensure that a proper response is given in a timely way. Um, they've also helped support um, school leaders in devising letters to go out to parents as well when there have been incidents as, as well. So that, that support from the media team has been really great. And then there is a national um, Department of Health, um, sorry, Public Health Department for Education helpline that schools can ring as well, um, which is available at particular times in the day. And then finally, just so it's all there in one place, I've got all the guidance there on a page if anybody is... Uh, got plenty of time to spend and they want to sit and read all that guidance uh, and, and if I've made any mistakes in any of the slides if you read all the guidance and let me know that would be really helpful but I don't think I have. Uh, Jack, can, I, can I just invite you Brian because we, I know we, we talk about it internally but could you just say a little bit more about the sort of longer term recovery for, for children uh, in schools and we of course the members will have seen the just prior to the summer holidays there was a bit of a a national meltdown, you know, the, the government's advisor, the SAR or advisor, whatever they call them these days, resigned because the government yes. weren't going to put enough money into it. Da, 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 da. Um, give us, can you give us a bit of a pricey of where, where you think we're, we're up to on that? Yeah. I think the first thing to say is you can't make a generalisation. You can get averages and you can say children are this far behind, but it is an average. And what I would say is every single child is unique. And that has been the starting point for the discussions with schools. Some children are in a better place with their anxiety because they've not been coming to school than they would had they been coming to school. Some children are actually further ahead with their reading than some schools expected because they have been read to every single day at home. Other children have clearly had the opposite effect and are feeling quite anxious about COVID and its impact on their learning. And some children we've found we're needing to work with incredibly tightly to try and accelerate their progress so that they get back on track to meet national um, norms. But you, what you can't do is generalise in all of this. So you have to have a really bespoke um, way of looking at that. I think the, the other bit to say, and it's important to remember this, remember the vulnerable children are the ones that have been to school the most. So schools remained open for children that were open to social care and children that were on free school meals. So some of the obvious areas where you might think there's been more learning loss, actually those children benefited because they were being taught in smaller groups in school with more teacher time directed at them. So it's a really mixed picture. Um, what we've tried to do with primary schools is to look at the key learning objectives that children need to learn in any given year and to strip those back to say, come on, there's some fluff in here as well as things that are really important. What's the really important stuff you have to learn in year four? And we've given schools advice on the key learning objectives they need to follow in each year to, to kind of get the children back on track. And that's been well received. So there's some curricular work you can do around that. Um, with secondary schools, um, for I feel desperately for year, children in year 10 and 11, particularly year 11, because they miss such big chunks. And I do hope um, that the work that the government are doing on the exam system gives an opportunity to narrow down the curriculum and actually to give the children some choices in the questions they answer in the exams, because they might not have had full coverage of the whole GCSE curriculum. So by giving choice, you test them on the aspects of the curriculum they have actually learnt and taught and, and I think that's where the government are going on that which I think will be um, welcome so 
lots and lots of work going on um, with schools. The, the work we did um, around giving the children GCSE grades, um, you know, to, to make you smile at that, sort of, for some of that, there's a huge body of evidence. For example, in writing, you can look through all the books and say, yeah, that looks like children have got a grade five last year. For design technology, you might have a teacher that rings up our school improvement team and say, look, I've got two sticks stuck together with a piece of glue. What sort of grade should I give? So you can see for some subjects, it was really quite tricky to come up with a grade for, and there was some guidance about what constitutes each of those GCSE grades, but teachers have worked really hard and across schools to try and make sure that they're moderated to give the best possible judgment they could and the most accurate judgment they could as well. So some terrific work been done by schools on the island and um, I pay a real tribute to school staff, both teachers and non-teaching staff and the head teachers on the island because they've been phenomenal throughout the COVID pandemic. They have been brilliant. Sorry, that was a very long answer, wasn't it? No, that was pretty short, Brian. So, firstly, thank you for keeping to time because I wasted a lot of time earlier. So thank you for that. But also thank you for condensing that. That didn't look easy. Um, so it is appreciated the amount of work you've put into that. Could we also somehow pass on the praise from uh, Brian to the public health team? Because I think it's important that they're recognised. And also uh, it's nice to hear a comment from someone so close to the coalface that the schools have done such a good job. So if we could somehow convey that back, that'd be fantastic. Richard, just, just to add, um, today has been the real first day. We've had significant numbers of schools open for children. The first couple of days they were having us inset days. And, and I, I've only got the data for about a third of the schools on the island have come through today. But we've got schools with 100% attendance today and lots of schools with 95, 98, 99% attendance. So the early evidence is that schools are, that children are returning in large numbers back to schools, which is a good thing. That's great. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Brian? Rodney, then Dave. Oh, thank you. Um, Brian, going back to those two tests, the PCR and the saliva, um, is there any data as to the accuracy of both those tests, please? Um, yeah, there's... there's three tests. There's a lateral flow device, which is the one that children put up their nose, down their throats, and they self-test on those. Um, I think you'll know there has been a series of false negatives and false positives with those. And some of that is, depends on how the test is carried out. So when you're giving 11, 12, 13 year olds, it's not as, it's not as strong into, you know, if they're doing it at home on their own compared to if they do it in front of a nurse. Mm -hmm. So we have had some pulse, false lateral flow device. The important bit is um, they ha it has identified children that have been positive though, and they have then gone on to have a positive PCR and then they've not been in school infecting others. So it has been a successful strategy in getting out to identify some positive children. The PCR test is the gold standard one that they go and have done at testing sites, and I think that's pretty accurate. The saliva test is also pretty accurate as well. Um, we wanted to introduce that to more schools earlier on, um, but the University of Southampton Hospital who are running that had some technical problems um, around the scheme, which they've only just managed to iron out. So um, from Monday, Medina House goes on to that scheme, and I'm you know, hoping that other schools on the island want to join that as, as well. David. Uh, we've had several cases on the hill where I live. We've actually been quite rife with COVID. It's, uh, I consider myself lucky because as far as I know, I don't think I've had it. But the neighbours and all their children have had it. Our clerks had it and his, his daughters had it. And we're, we're getting cases where from Nettlestone Primary School that classes are being sent home because one child's got COVID. And this is causing problems, obviously, with the families because some of them haven't got provision for childcare, et cetera, et cetera. Is there going to be anything tried to be done to resolve that? Whereas if we get one child with it, we're not going to send the whole class home. Um, that, that's exactly what's going to happen from now on. So the only child that will be sent home is the positive one. If National Health Track and Trace say these are the closest contacts that that child has had, their immediate close contacts, they will be asked, those children will be asked to go and do a PCR test. 
they can return to school until the PCR test result is through, so they don't have to go home and self-isolate. But obviously, if that comes through positive, they then need to self-isolate because they're positive. So we shouldn't see whole classes needing to be sent home because one child has tested positive. Um, I have to tell people though that the area where we might see some issues is if teachers test positive. We've only got a certain number of teachers on the island and, the number of, and a certain number of supply teachers. So that's when it might get more tricky if we have two or three teachers test positive in a, in a, in a school, particularly a small primary. And you, Karen, and then Tig. I was just wondering what we're doing to uh, look after staff and children's mental health through all this process. Yeah, the, the government have given us a small grant, a well-being grant. So um, that has um, given us um, enough to do some webinars with schools to give them some mental health materials that they can use with the students and their staff. And we've rolled those out um, last September and again in the spring term last year. There are huge numbers of resources available to schools actually for use in the classroom with the children around the well-being agenda. In, in fact, the complaint we're currently getting from schools is they don't know which resources to use because there are so many of them. So we're doing a piece of work at the moment to try and pull together in one place all the mental health activities so schools can be given some clearer guidance as to which bits are better and when they're appropriate as well. Um, other, so, so much of it is about low level anxiety um, for those children that have got more complex mental health issues who may have lost parents or close relatives. Um, again, there is support out there from agencies like CAMS as well, and, and they are stepping into that space as well. The other bit I'd say is for some of this, we don't know when the mental health issues will come out because they might not come out immediately. If you've lost close members of your family, it may be years, particularly if you're a very young child, it may be years before the anxiety of that comes out and we need to be ready to pick up those balls when they bounce at a future date. Can I just ask, so as we're safeguarding, is there a lead in the school that's, that's taken that on? There is. It tends to be um, the same person that is the special needs coordinator as well, but not exclusively so. Um, many many people have a, a mental health and wellbeing lead in schools as well. Most schools do. And, and we have a lead officer, um, Karen Nye, who's leading on that across the piece for us with schools. There's, a, there's an equivalent lead in the um, mental health service as well to, to join that. Thank you, Ryan. There's, I mean, I know from experience there's a five to six month waiting list for CAMS so on, the, on the island, so I know that that's um, fairly problematic. Cathy? Um, just to add as well, the island was successful. I'm just trying to think back when we had our mental health support team bid a couple of years ago, and those workers are now being deployed across schools, and so that was a joint partnership bid between education, children's social care, and um, also some voluntary organisations on the island, so the Youth Trust and Bernardo's are heavily involved in that and are deploying staff across schools. So again, that's about trying to get in early, um, working to support strategies in schools and provide some direct support to children within schools at an earlier stage before that escalates to CAMS. Thank you, Cathy. Teague. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Brian, for the report. I hope you're enjoying being back at Fratton Park as much as I am. Um, <laughs> um, quick question in relate, relation to what you mentioned about the CO2 level testing and areas of poor ventilation. I was wondering whether there was any additional support from central government if uh, areas of a particular school were seen to be poorly ventilated uh, and you know, needed additional ventilation or air conditioning? Um, we understand that CO2 monitors are going to be starting to be sent out next week, starting with special schools. What we haven't seen is the instructions that go with those. So I don't want to preempt what that might say, but um, were Steve answering this question, he would say the main guidance is to open the window. Uh, I did actually a while back when I saw this from coming, and I I talked to our lead capital guy Pete Colnett, who occasionally comes to these meetings, and I said, you know, what, what about these mobile air cleaning units, Pete? And um, 
and he knows about this stuff. So, I, and his advice was that um, the practicality of, of uh, the practical of using them, let alone whether you can actually get one, because you know the, the availability is limited, um, isn't really very useful in a school environment. Uh, it they're expensive uh, to purchase and install. You've got to clean all the filters regularly. Uh, you've got to maintain them. Uh, you, you've got to. It's, it would effectively be a significant revenue burden on schools. So his advice was, open the window. <laughs> can, can I add the, the other bit to say is, I think we're in a stronger position on the island than we might be in many other local authorities, and that's because of the um, incredible amount, actually, of rebuild that's gone on. So if you think about the secondary school state, nearly all of them have been rebuilt or undertaken, have gone through a, a huge, great refurbishment, and the same is true in the primary sector. So many of the buildings are pretty modern on the Isle of Wight, actually, so therefore have got better ventilation built in than perhaps some of the older buildings that other local authorities are dealing with. Thank you. Rob. Thank you, um, Chair. Yeah, just following that, I don't know if Steve's already answered my question, whether there's one and the same thing, but I'm aware that a number of schools have been contacted by companies offering air filtration and purification systems, claiming you know, government back research and there's grants and so on available for them. Do, do you know if that's true, that there are grants available and is the advice the same, you know, open the windows or is this something that schools maybe in the future are going to be expected to, to invest in? I, I'll venture an opinion. Because uh, I, uh, <laughs> I heard that, uh, um, somebody on the radio saying, the, the other day saying the Welsh Government have bought some of these. Um, I. I then listened to the scientists saying, well, actually, um, we, we can't guarantee that it would pick up all the COVID in a particular classroom and all the rest of it. And I think, I think it's an awful lot of money to spend on something that might not work, as well as opening the window, which after all is free. So <laughs> um, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily be advising those schools to do that unless they've got a particular need that they can evidence and that they can evidence that the, the filtration unit would work. I have to say, I've not heard of any government grants on this, but I, I, I could stand to be corrected on that. Any further questions? Just one, going back to costs really, as you mentioned, is windows open this time of year is not too bad. Come December, February, March, windows open is gonna have an impact on heating costs, I presume. Also, cover for uh, teachers i know insurance school cover maternity leave and the like is so well basic question where, where where's the money coming from the the interesting bit of school finances during the pandemic is um actually across the island and in most other local authorities schools have ended up with higher balances at the end of last financial year than they did previous what we found is if you don't have the children in and they're all at home, schools are cheaper to run. <laughs> so bizarrely, schools have ended up with higher balances and are in a better position. We, have, we, have, we now have less schools in a deficit position than any other year I can remember, actually, because they, they managed to pay them that because of the increased balances. Yeah. Also, some schools might have had to put a bit of money aside for a, a you know, minor building project and so on, and they've not been able to do it because of the, the restrictions. So they, that money's just sitting there, and will probably be used next year for that that project. But it, it, they couldn't progress it, so those balances have grown. So, so at this stage, you're not too worried about financial stress increase on on schools. School, schools were also able, if they could evidence additional COVID expenditure, they were able to put in for a grant for the DfE. And many schools on the island did do that. So there was additional money available. Whether I'm not aware that that scheme is going to run again from September, though. <laughs> Thank you for that. So uh, no further questions. Performance and budgets. Well, the stress is on you two now. I've overrun. Um, so we've prepared some slides um, the first few relate specifically to children's social care and then there's some um, education ones as well um, just to provide a few headlines um, at the start 
So what we have seen since I last came to uh, scrutiny is that demand has remained high, no surprise there really. And really we're looking at 20 to 30% above normal levels. So that has been sustained now over a six month period and, and we're predicting that it will be sustained um, in the short to medium term. So we're obviously having to look at how do we um, ensure that all of those children and families are getting the support that they need um, and, and look at our structures etc to make sure that we've got the capacity to deal with that. Very fortunately the local authority has invested in um, additional social work capacity however I did want to highlight that we have whilst we've got the funding resource for that actually the whole of the country is out looking for additional social workers and there is a struggle to recruit particularly agency social workers um, and that's for some of our frontline teams it's a national issue but obviously with the island and um, we've talked about housing issues etc there is an added factor there so we're working hard we do provide um, additional resource around travel to the island um, we've also um, provided accommodation grants to um, some of our workers as well to to get them over here but it is something that we have to keep on top of all of the time um, having said that actually um, we are delivering good services and I shall go on to um, talk about uh, how we're managing some of that workflow we did have a nice surprise visit um, at the end of July from Ofsted um, who undertook a focused visit uh, little probably a little bit earlier than we were anticipating but that was absolutely fine so right at the end of term um, it was two week intensive inspection on children in need and child protection so very much about um, looking at our thresholds looking at how we've managed to safeguard children and families um, over the last uh, year um, really focused a lot of activity um, and I shall be uh, I think it's the 7th of September we get the letter is published yeah just to say on that um, the, the report is embargoed until the 7th of September so it will be published on the 7th of September it's not a in fact, it's not really a report, it's a letter. It's not a graded judgment, so you don't get a, a grade attached to it. It just describes a particular area of practice. It's actually quite technical, um, but what um, is uh, the, the important thing on this the sort of payoff line is that, um, don't forget that in 2018, relatively recently, we were judged as being good in all domains. Um, and uh, we can, we in our self-assessment, we continue to be good and improving and the payoff line in the report is that senior leaders and managers have an accurate view of the quality of practice. So the code is, yes, that's where we are. So we are continuing to, to improve from a very high level. So that's really, really positive. It's a positive letter, but a bit technical when you actually um, get to see it. But that's, that's fine. I can, I can more, more than happy with it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's that was obviously um, a, a good boost to our, our kind of service provision. Um, so what the next slides cover um, are just some of the data in relation to, I mean, some of it's performance, but some of it is just kind of understanding the demand on the system. So the first slide relates to contacts. Um, you'll see slightly down on um, kind of where we were in quarter one, 18, 19, but fairly sustained. But I think the next slide is the important one for us to be considering. And this is, so a contact is any contact um, that comes in through CRT MASH. So it might be an inquiry around information. We may be able to provide advice and actually that closes down that contact. The next slide is about referrals, so that those are the cases. Um, so on my documents, this is saying for page 106. Um, so these are the cases that go through to the MASH to be triaged, to be looked at and assessed. Um, and you'll see that there's been a significant increase in those referrals. I think just to highlight, there are two grey lines on the slide, and those indicate when the national lockdowns happened. 
And what you can see is that we would have a, an initial decline in terms of the number of referrals coming through. And then that was followed as we started to unlock by a significant increase in referrals coming through. And so that happened at the end of quarter one and also at the end of quarter three and has been maintained. Moving on to the next slide, what I'm pleased to report is despite that significant increase in demand, actually we're seeing that our performance in terms of completing child and family assessments has actually been maintained. So whilst my teams are doing significantly more assessments than they have in previous years, actually the timeliness is still above 90%. So I think that's really significant to show that actually we're still meeting the needs of children and families. The next slide I think is quite dramatic. Um, so we, as I think I described at our last meeting, we had seen over the last four years a sustained incremental decrease in the number of children open to child protection planning. Um, as a result of all the hard work of partner agencies across the island. What we have seen um, since the onset of the pandemic is, and in line with national indicators as well, is a significant increase in children open to child protection. And that's twofold, really. What we have seen is that some of the cases that normally we'd, we would have been able to progress and actually those cases could step down or close to children's services, actually some of the services that we rely on across multi-agency partners partnerships have not been able to deliver support to families and we have wanted to maintain those families on a child protection plan so that they're getting really regular visiting and support from social care as well as obviously an increase into the system and um, as I described I think last time we've seen a significant increase in relation to adults mental health and their ability therefore to support their own children also domestic abuse has increased significantly and substance misuse issues. They're, they're the three areas where we've seen quite significant increase. Actually, I'll add another to that one is around adolescent mental health as well. Um, and that's been a significant factor as well. So moving on, um, children in need. So this is the sort of next um, category down from um, child protection. So these are families that um, in order for those children to thrive, need the support and assistance um, of a multi-agency plan. Um, you will again see that we've seen quite a significant increase. Um, just to say that the red dotted line um, on all of these slides is where we thought we would be when we were predicting and forecasting um, a couple of years ago, looking at our data. So you'll see quite a significant increase there. So again, evidencing the demand. What I'm pleased to report at the moment is that actually we are not seeing the same type of increase in terms of our looked after children cohort. We have um, put in quite a lot of work over the last two years on a transformation agenda about really driving to support children to enable them to, and families rather to enable those children to live safely at home. And I think what we're seeing is that that intensive work is paying off. And actually through our RAF team, our Resilience Around Families team, our social work change to our methodology, as well as the work that we're doing across our partner agencies, um, that is ensuring that those cases aren't escalating for those children to need to come into care. So obviously we're looking at that being maintained. We're doing further work over the next couple of years in terms of, you know, always continuously improving, reviewing what we're doing. How can we further strengthen that? There's a lot of training going on in terms of social workers around trauma-informed practice, motivational interviewing, restorative practice, and we're seeing the benefit of that um, in, in that data there. Just coming on this one, Cathy, there's, oh. a, there's another dimension to this which is quite important, which will, uh, in subsequent meetings you want to talk about, um, which is this is where the money is. Um, the costs, uh, most of what we spend within children's services is, goes on the direct costs of care. It's the majority of the budget. And there's some good news in this slide. Um, what we have proposed to the Section 151 officer uh, a couple of years ago, but we'll talk about it again this year, is that if you follow the upward trajectory that this line was on in quarter four, 1920, if you just trace that upwards, that is our budgeted uh, growth. 
Okay. If it, and the gap between that imaginary line that if you can trace through your fingers and the actual is saving. So by doing really good social work, we save money. And that's the that's the basis of what we're trying to do in children's services, that transformation program, which is commented on really positively in the Ofsted letter. That transformation program is really good practice, really good social work, but actually saves money and is part of our, our budget plan going forward. Just put that in there for you to cogitate on as, as we as we go as we go forward in terms of budget setting. Thanks, Steve. And then just the final slide in relation to um, children's social care is around quality assurance, because I think, you know, we can provide data on demand and the number of um, children that are open to children's social care. But actually, the really important thing is, are we delivering a quality um, service to our children and families? So um, we undertake very regular case auditing um, and all of my senior managers undertake that um, across the department and I've just highlighted some of the evidence from those audits in quarter one um, so practitioner analysis influencing the plan in 99% of cases evidence that the assessment has informed the intervention plan in 90% um, evidence of multi-agency engagement, um, which is hugely important in 97% of cases, and that that has improved outcomes for the child in all of those cases as well. Um, one of the areas that I highlighted at our last meeting as an area of imp for improvement was regular supervision. Um, partly that's about us making sure that we record it in the right place, um, that it goes onto the case file so it can be seen. If, if it's not on the case file, we basically say it hasn't happened. Um, so we've seen a significant improvement since um, I last reported to you. So we were seeing evidence as per policy in 85% of cases. It is still something we're absolutely driving at. And um, again, Ofsted saw some evidence of um, really excellent supervision, but they said that that needs to be consistent across the service. And obviously, um, we want to support our social workers in the best way possible, just like teachers. They've had a very difficult year and it's our job to make sure that we have a duty of care for them and support them in doing their jobs. So we're absolutely robust and driving at this um, and, and already seeing further improvements. So finishes my slides and I shall uh, well should I take any questions at that stage thank you Cathy any questions at all for Cathy you might go away lightly on this one Cathy it might be right Ooh. okay I shall hand over to Brian really swiftly <laughs> um this is new day so that we're sharing for the first time ordinarily we've always just done this as a social care update and um Prompted by Steve, we thought it would be good to start including on a quarterly basis the education inclusion headlines, but particularly when um, last year and this year there isn't going to be a wealth of examination data available because obviously the, that's not going to be published. It was a methodology of getting GCSE grades to children rather than measuring school performance. So um, the first one we, we, we'd offer is um, the September guarantee, and that's a guarantee that the uh, that's expressed nationally whereby what we try and do is to ensure that every single child during the September after they've left school um, ends up in education, employment or training. Um, and it's an indicator where we do really well on the Isle of Wight and we probably don't shout out to, about it enough. So we exceed regional averages, we exceed national averages and you'll see that 98.2% of children leave in uh, year old this data this was the September that last year um, compared to a national average of 94% so we're really good at getting children into education employment or, or training it's, it's a strength and um, the Island Futures team do some incredible work tracking those children that are not in education employment and training and intervening. Um, the second one is around education health and care plans um, nationally Last year, around 55% of those were produced on time. My intelligence from working with other AEDs across the southeast is that figure will decline this year. Um, and local authorities are struggling to get those out on time, generally nationally. Um, we produced 93% on time in the last quarter. So again, we're doing really well compared to kind of national averages on, on that measure as well. 
Um, the proportion of schools graded good or better of Ofsted is currently um, at around 75%. It's hugely frustrating for me because I know we've got schools that are currently judged to be required improvement that if Ofsted came back and inspected, they would make good. But there has been no full inspection of any school now um, during the pandemic. So we've got schools that are ready to be inspected. We believe they are now producing a good education, but in the public domain, um, they've still got a required improvement judgment. And um, certainly I foresee that that figure will go up um, over the next period of time as Ofsted start to um, return into to schools. Um, what I would say is that Ofsted have carried out monitoring visits to those schools that are currently requiring improvement. Um, and in every case, in every case, they have concluded the school is taking effective action to be good at the time of the next inspection. So I think that's a good place to be. That's the judgment that they've been making. Um, the number of children currently being electively home educated on the island is 464, and that compared to 375 the previous year. We know from talking with those parents that many of those have said, I just don't think school is a safe place to be during a pandemic and I'm going to electively home educate my child. Um, none of us know at the moment, and I won't crystal ball gaze for you, how many of those students will actually turn back and come back into school once um, there's some sort of normality. Um, but I think it's interesting to look at that figure at the moment and to see whether that changes over time. So I think that would be an interesting one for the committee to investigate. Um, the other stat that I think is really good on the island, many other local authorities um, only dream of this figure. We are in contact with 90% of those families that electively home educate and um, actually positive feedback generally from the, the parents about the support of that EAG team. I say EAG team, it's one person plus a little bit. Um, the number of permanent exclusions um, last year was 17 and again you have to put that in context of Martin's figures where you, you know there were over 15,000 students in our school, so 17 of those were permanently excluded. Um, we have a duty as a local authority to find education within six days of a child being permanently excluded, and that's what the Island Learning Centre is using for. We, we broker places those for those students that are permanently excluded. Um, and the fixed term, fixed period exclusions last year was um, just over a thousand. That is not a thousand different children. Quite often what you have is a child with persistent behaviour that may be excluded several times over the course of a year. So it's, it's, a, it's not a thousand different students. It's not one in 15 students are, um, are fixed term excluded. Can I just say that the government have just changed the words around this. So permanent exclusions now has gone back to suspensions. Uh, no, sorry, expulsions. Fixed period exclusions has gone back to suspensions, so the language around that has changed, and I think that's regrettable because I don't particularly think those words are very helpful, but they, they have done. Um, what we'll do around permanent exclusions and fixed period exclusions, you've obviously got those as a baseline. Moving forward as we go through the quarters, we'll give you a cumulative total as we go through each quarter so you can see how this year's trend is looking compared to those as a baseline. Um, and again, as I say, examinations, I can't really give data on that at this current time because they're, they're not publicly produced. And then finally, again, attendance data does not exist in the public domain and has not been published by the DfE for last year because of the pandemic. However, um, I had regular conversations with the DfE who were receiving attendance data from all schools on a daily basis. And in all the conversations I had, they kept saying, how are you doing what you are doing on the Isle of Wight? Your upper quartile performance every month around attendance in both primary and secondary. So um, with the exception of a period in January, do you remember the island suddenly had a spike of cases in January? And I think we went from being categorised a one up to a four or from a four to a one kind of overnight. We saw a lack of attendance once that happened for a period of weeks, but that actually stabilised and students went back into school after that. But it, it, that, that was kind of interesting. So attendance last year has been good. And you'd like to think, therefore, because attendance has been higher, that that will put us in a better position when examinations are taken um, in the summer, because our children have been in school more than many others nationally. I'm going to be made to eat my words around that, aren't I? <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Any questions for Brian? Susie. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question around the EHICPS, please? That's a huge difference. When numbers are kind of such disparity in numbers, it always makes me question, really. So if the national average is 55% and we're, we've got 93.2% produced on time, why? Why, how, what, why have we got such a good figure? Is it because we aren't producing as many? Are we not issuing as many plans as, as nationally or...? Why is there such a disparity? It's interesting. The opposite is true on the island. 5% of children on the island have an EHCP compared to 3.7% nationally. So we have a higher proportion of the population with an EHCP. It really is down to very impressive performance of the team, who um, are really proud of that performance uh, and actually are working really hard to maintain it. And they see it as a personal insult if they don't get a case through on time. Actually, the the 93%, the 7% relates to two students. And you can't do all of them in on, in, on time in 20 weeks. Quite often, parents will say, I want to work with you over a slightly longer period of time to get an EHCP that I want, rather than one that's rushed within 20 weeks. So some, sometimes, actually, you don't get them through in 20 weeks because that's the parental preference. But it's good performance by the team, actually. Thank you. That's lovely to hear that. Thanks. The other, the other factor that's in there, it doesn't take away from the performance of the team at all. Um, around the country, uh, there has been a significant surge in applications for education, health and care plans. The national figure is something like 73% uh, increase. Um, argue, we haven't seen that sort of surge on the Isle of Wight, and partly that's because we've, we've got a history of having a higher, a higher percentage already within the HCP. So, Arguably, we didn't need to do the, the catch up that other authorities are having to do, uh, and that, that's probably a factor in this as well. Any further questions? Thank you. Yeah, that picture is helpful. Are those the right sort of indicators? We, we also were interested in the kind of conversation with members that that was helpful as well. well I'll ask members of the committee is it useful information? Is there anything else you'd like to see from that data? Uh, it, it appears to be uh, extremely useful, Brian, yeah, and I think as we go through it and we see it more often, we're probably in a better position to uh, question it, but well done, thank you for that. So I think that leads us on nicely to the committee work plan. Sorry, Susie, I thought you were going to ask a question. Uh, committee work plan, so um, really just to look at what we might want to uh, consider as relevant items for the committee over the coming year. Um, I'd like to encourage you to think outside of the sort of run-of-the-mill things we might uh, consider, because I think you see the Children's Services team are pretty good at covering those. So it might be a, a question around some support, but things may be a bit, a bit more creative and look at the wider issues, maybe things around um, child child health care or child health within schools and how that affects the education setting. Skills and employment of staff, I think, because we heard there's probably a possibility of, of, of problems with social workers and teachers and possibly how we may interact with the college as well. But that, they're just ideas from me. So please feel free to, to shout out um, Paul or we all uh, write them down, I'm sure. There's yeah, there's probably, uh, we could probably wrap that up in something around the sort of skills offer, um, don't you think? And, and sort of, yeah, we'll we, we leave that, yeah, I think it's a good idea and we can, but we might broaden it to look at the sort of skills and, and also perhaps a little bit of thinking about what, so we may match the skills that are needed now. Are we going to match the skills for what's needed in five years' time. Those sorts of questions, I think, are probably worth uh, uh, going around. Any other ideas? I think um, the ideas I was thinking around about including children's health in schools is things that you said mentioned before. Um, and I guess it, it's not down to tell us what to do, it's to help form policy. But would I think that would be a useful thing to include. I don't know what the professionals think. Yeah. And then, and I don't know what influence we can have on it, but I am very worried about a lack of skills in terms of teachers and social workers and the like coming through. So it's again, is there anything we can do as part of this committee to help or help 
as we go, as we can see it come down the track. Advantages of committees like this is that um, you, you collectively have got such a range of skills and knowledge that, that you might see things that we haven't seen. So that would be really, I think, might be quite a helpful topic, actually. And lastly, I think the college, because we don't mention the college much, do we, in these meetings? I know it's outside of your remit, isn't it? But I think it'd be useful for us just in terms of other interactions with the college, whether we can have some form some sort of um, partnership with them, perhaps. Anything else? Come on, you'll have things, loads of things when you go out of the meeting. David. I, th I thought you raised a very good point there regarding skills. I was reading an article in the paper the other week, and it's, uh, it reminded me of when I was young. I was very fortunate when I left school. didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. But I dropped into an apprenticeship. And I noticed early on, even back in my day, that they was disappearing. And not everyone is geared up to go to university. And I think it's quite important. If you look at the actual skill shortage on the Isle of Wight, just with our building programmes, everything that goes with it, we have a serious lack and a very small skills base. And can we not put more emphasis on when the kids leave school, maybe between this 16 and 18 year age gap where they have to do this additional two years, that we can try and form some of these apprentices, get them up and running back in more traditional trades, where they, because with a traditional trade, like I'm an industrial pipe fitter by trade, but some people call me a builder, some people just call me a plumber. But it's, uh, I've been self-employed since I was 20, just trying to give you the background. And a lot of my work went from sort of, as people got to know me, Dave, while well, you're here, can you just do this? And all of a sudden, I top up hanging the door, I'm putting up ceilings, I work for a while, constructing ceilings and petitions. And, but I've got quite a wide skill base. And that today, seems to be disappearing. And I think that's a shame. And I think when I look at the overall situation on the island, can we not encourage some of the children to come out, not give them this mindset that they have to go to university, that they've got another real choice? Because I think there is a real choice out there if we make it happen for them. But yeah, I think it's... We can bring that through as an agenda item and have a really, I think, a proper discussion on this. I think it's be a really good item for us to get our teeth into. Yeah, to be, to be controversial there, I think we need to do both. Uh, so I think there's something around apprenticeships and we can bring the pay from what we're doing around that because the number of apprenticeships has been increasing in the last few years because we've had a real focus on that. So we can bring some pay, paper which shows that. The other bit is, if we want to attract inward investment as an economic development strategy on the island, you've got to have the skills that the companies you want to attract to the island might want as well. So there's a kind of bit around the skills agenda around that as well, I think. Thank you, sir. Anything else? Susie, do you have something? I haven't fully formed my thoughts around it, actually, but I have a slightly different perspective on the apprenticeships, to be honest. I've got three sons. One went to university and now teaches over here. Two went through the apprenticeship route over here. Um, one in marine engineering and one in building. Um, I don't know that we really have a lack of provision for children, school leavers going. I think that, I, I don't think that school leavers feel they're getting a, a bad deal by going into apprenticeships. I don't get that feeling from talking to young people. What I do think we are perhaps lacking is the larger employers that are able to offer the apprenticeships. And I think my husband's a builder. Um, he, We don't employ anybody. We use subcontractors. We've looked into having apprentices. And to be honest, it's not viable for us to do that. And he has a lot of skills he could pass on. So perhaps the support needs to go to the smaller businesses over here in order to help them be able to offer the skills sorry i'm i'm thinking as i speak so i'm not fully formed in the debate but they, they, <laughs> they, they, it's really, but it's really, that's because it's really interesting and and but there are some really frustrating restrictions on the apprenticeship levy that, yeah. that drive me nuts to be honest but we, we can we can but i mean it, that does prove it's a very well agenda item so thank you both of that. anything else because you'll all walk out and go oh, i should have said don't worry, you can email Paul. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, any 
questions at all outside of the ones we've already had? Rodney. Just going back to the School of Missions, if I may, um, how much does Ofsted result uh, counting people in, in parents' decisions about which school they're going to send their child to? I think it counts a lot. Um, but you have to remember, uh, so, but it doesn't, that doesn't affect the numbers that Martin talked about. The, the numbers are affected by something else, which is the 20 to 40 year old. Um, and other, and other. <laughs> Ryan's on that, he's got and a strategy. And other that. things, yeah. <laughs> um, but so, so the basic, the numbers don't change. It's about where the parents choose to send them, and that changes. But the, the contradiction in that, which we have to wrestle with, is that a school building, you know, lasts 150 years. Uh, head teachers might last four or five years, and the school Ofsted judgment might last three years. So these things change. And I and talk from my own experience. Um, my children ended up going to a school that was graded as inadequate, but it was the right school for them. Cause, and for all sorts of different reasons, and um, and they've done really well out of it. And they, so, parents have to make up. You know, all of us have to make up our own minds about those those things. And Ofsted is an important factor, but it's not the only factor. I think. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, well, the per perception is that um, you know they judge it on Ofsted results, and if so, for there those pupils are at this certain school and it gets a not very good result then what's the is there a a, a great likelihood or that people will move their children and disrupt their education we don't see very much of people moving their children what you see is a drop off in the admissions so you, you don't see people applying you don't see um for all the reasons that you would think parents aren't willing to disrupt their children's education quite rightly but they tend to choose somewhere else at the admissions round at year seven or something thank you any further questions dave that's all right you carry on just getting back to what susie said and i agree 100 percent. it's actually very difficult to take people on on the building as an apprentice because they've got so much rights and the cost of employing them is expensive. What I was actually referring to when, when I was younger is not just the job. I, I was lucky because circumstances was different, but at school, the school provided for us. There was a certain amount of boys. We got to go to the Wandsworth School of Building. And for the last six months of our schooling, we had one afternoon a week where we went to the School of Building. And it gave us quite a good insight. We'd done a little bit of brick lane, a bit of carpentry, bit of metal work, bit of plumbing. Could we not do something along those lines? So if we had this proportion of 16 to 18 year olds that felt they might want to do that, would that not just give them a head start? Is it something we could look at? Would it be, I don't know, it might be a complete waste of time, but would those two years, if they was like made to do that rather than doing the university thing, would it help them get a foot on the ladder so that when they actually step into the employment workplace full time, the builders would be in a better position to think, well, yeah, we can do that. It's rather than just a pair of ads, because 90% of the time they get used to just cheap labour. They're just a source of cheap labour. And they run around for the builder and do this, do that. And I think if we could give them that start, we could do something good. I've, the chair's got his BDI on me. So I, I think that we will give you the answer to that question. But not now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. So that's probably the best sensible answer you could give. I think. I mean, it, 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 probably the last comment is: it is crazy. There's no boat building courses, apprenticeships, or anything on on the island within schools. But we'll, we'll leave that. So thank you, David. And, and, yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, I mean, it's very valid. I mean, you know, you've got a fantastic response from, from the team that, that are on it. Any other questions? Or, or I've, I've not failed this time because I think the first meeting will be the record. So, unfortunately, it's downhill from our end. So, if there's nothing else, I'd like to thank those that have been on a mini cruise to get over it, even if it painfully was. Those that have joined us online as well, thank you.
that's slightly faster now. It's just it's coming at seven. Yeah. Um, and thank you to our new committee members and thank you to the rest of you. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.